Great. Thank you very much. Um, so yeah, it's uh, remarkable to listen to Barbell's talk and realize that we're moving into a, a time period with unprecedented uh, ocean conditions and that conditions are changing at an unprecedented rate. Um, so it, it's, it's sobering. And, uh, so I, I work for NOAA Fisheries. Our responsibility is providing science um, for the sustainable management of fisheries resources, um, and the you know the changes which are occurring present significant challenges to that management. So um, we're trying to develop uh, tools and information to help managers uh, sort of manage species as the environment is changing into new conditions and changing very rapidly. Um, and as Barbel, um, you know, indicated that you know ocean acidification is not happening by itself. It's part of a, you know the larger impacts of climate change, the increased or increasing emissions of CO2 into the atmosphere. Um, and from the northeast U.S., um, which is where I work, I, I live and work in Rhode Island, um, we have evidence this is a 150-year temperature record from the ocean, um, and that the line that you see is the long-term change in ocean temperatures. And so it's increased by 1.3 um, degrees Celsius. Um, we also know that salinity in the ecosystem is changing. Um, precipitation over land is changing. And stream flow is changing. Um, as Barbel talked about, um, ocean acidification is happening. Uh, there's evidence for changes in the currents in the region. So the Gulf Stream, which brings warm, salty tropical water up, um, is, has been moving northward. Um, there's changes in wind patterns. The jet stream has shifted northward um, in recent years. And then there's very good evidence that sea level is rising. And in fact, the northeast US is, uh, is where some of the sea level rise rates are the highest in the country. So the, the populations or the resources that we're responsible for providing scientific advice for are experiencing a whole host of changes in their environment. Um, and it's our job working for NOAA Fisheries to try to provide advice to managers um, as to how to deal with these changes in the environment and the resulting changes in the populations that they manage. And so the other thing that we know from uh, climate modelers is that this climate, the climate change issue um, is going to continue for the foreseeable future. And foreseeable future is kind of a buzzword. Um, it's part of many of the laws that uh, are responsible for resource species in the country. Um, so we know that climate change is going to happen for at least the next 50 years, um, and then depending on what choices we make, um, it may continue to happen at a very fast rate, or if we uh, control our CO2 emissions, the rate of climate change may slow um, in the second half of this century. But this shows uh, projections from a climate models of the pH in the ocean in US water. So this is the average projected modeled pH um, in sort of the 2050 time frame. I mean, you can see that there's some variability, um, lower, higher pHs and lower pHs. Um, but then if you look at the change in pH, so this is pH from the past, uh, pH in the future minus pH in the past, you see that it's uniform. It's uniformly blue. Um, and so these climate models project that pH worldwide uh, will continue to decrease. And again, this blue color is about a 0.1 uh, decrease in pH. But as Barbel mentioned, you know, pH is a log scale. So that actually represents a 26% decrease in the amount of hydrogen ions in the water. Um, and this is, you know, for the, since the Industrial Revolution began, we've experienced the 0.1 decrease. Um, climate models suggest that, you know, by the middle of this century, we will have experienced another 0.1 decrease. And then the rate that that continues um, is sort of within our control in terms of our um, choices about greenhouse gas emissions. And uh, what some of the, the way climate modelers talk about it is they use these regional concentration pathways, which are basically scenarios about how much CO2 are we going to admit, how is population going to grow, a number of other economic components. 
Um, and so this is, if you look at the Paris Accord in 2015, um, sort of the worst case scenario, if we don't sort of deal with what we put on the table in Paris, we'll have a decrease in pH by the middle of the century of 0.1. Um, and so that will create significant challenges for marine resources in the region. So what we've been working on in NOAA Fisheries is developing uh, a, a tool or a methodology to evaluate the vulnerability of fish and invertebrate species to a changing climate. And this methodology was first used in the Northeast. Um, and it's based on a vulnerability assessment framework. So it's not a, you know, a numbers model where you, where you pr parameterize a very specific model for a given population. It's more of a qualitative tool that lets you look at current and existing knowledge and then use expert opinion as to what are the attributes of a given species, what is going to happen in the future from these climate models. And it lets you compare and contrast this quantitative data and qualitative information when data is lacking. And there's a number of steps in this assessment process. I'm not going to go through these now, um, but I'm going to talk about the results of the assessment in the Northeast US. So this assessment takes two components. It has the exposure, um, the exposure of species to climate change in a given region, and it has sensitivity. What are the attributes of the different species relative to the ability to respond to climate change? And so in the Northeast, we included 82 species. So we looked into understanding of the sensitivity for all of these different components for all of the different 82 species. And so here you see the ocean acidification factor. Um, if a species is sensitive to an ocean acidification, it gets a higher sensitivity, which contributes to a higher vulnerability. On the exposure side, we looked at the magnitude uh, of sea surface temperature changes projected in the future, the magnitude of air temperature changes, salinity, ocean acidification, precipitation, changes in currents, changes in sea level rise. So here's ocean acidification as part of a number of uh, environmental parameters that are likely to change as a result of climate change. Ocean acidification, about a 0.1 unit by the middle of the century. That goes into the exposure, gets combined with the sensitivity to come up with an overall species vulnerability. So for this exposure of ocean acidification, we use these climate models. Um, then the climate models came from a, a large international effort called the International Panel of Climate Change Fifth Assessment Report. Um, there are about 13 uh, global models included. And so these global models, uh, on average, uh, suggest that pH will decrease by about 0.1. Um, by the middle of the century. And so the exposure uh, to ocean acidification, the magnitude of change in ocean acidification is very high. Again, 0.1 doesn't seem like a big number, but it represents a 20%, 26% decrease or uh, change in the acidity of the ocean. Then for the sensitivity attributes um, regarding ocean acidification, we used predominantly uh, an analysis which was sort of summarized all the available information as of 2013. And it looked at different groups of species, so mollusks are the clams and scallops, echinoderms are the sea urchins and starfish, crustaceans are the crabs and lobsters, and fish. So the study summarized a, a large number of other studies and you see that there's a lot of evidence for ocean acidification having a negative impact on the survival of clams and scallops, the calcification of clams and scallops, the growth of clams and scallops, the development of clams and scallops. Um, there are some negative effects on echinoderm, sea urchins, and starfish, uh, but there's some areas where the, you know, the evidence is not clear one way or the other. And then for crustaceans and fish, the evidence is not really clear one way or the other. So in our sort of sensitivity, the mollusks in our 82 species had a high to very high sensitivity. The echinoderms, uh, the sea urchin predominantly, had a moderate to high. And the crustaceans and the fish had a low to moderate sensitivity. And then we combine these the 
biological sensitivity with the climate exposure and end up with a matrix of anticipated vulnerability to climate change in the northeast U.S. region by the middle of the century. And you can see ocean quahog, a type of clam, northern quahog, a type of clam, Atlantic sea scallop, a type of scallop, Atlantic surf clam, a type of clam. These mollusks are showing up as orange, highly vulnerable, or red, very highly vulnerable. And if you look back into the assessment, you see that this vulnerability comes from the impacts of ocean acidification on mollusks. And as Bogle mentioned, you know, the species which form these calcium carbonate shells, um, which seem to be most impacted by ocean acidification. So when we look at the assessment results across the exposure factors, um, remember we looked at temperature and salinity and ocean acidification and precipitation. We see that in the northeast region, it's really the changes in ocean temperature which had the highest effect and the changes in ocean acidification which had the highest effect. We also see air temperature as having an effect um, and that's going to impact sort of fresh water and shallow water temperatures. So ocean acidification is part of the story in terms of the climate change effects on resource populations, but it's not the whole story. We also have in this region changes in temperature which are going to be important. So moving forward, we're taking the results of this assessment and linking it to an assessment of fishing community vulnerability. So our work looked at the effect of climate change on fish and invertebrates. We can then look at the effect of climate change on fish and invertebrates to the communities that depend on catching those fish and invertebrates. So that's sort of trying to get at the, the human impact of climate change effect on fisheries. The other part which um, Hauke will talk about in the next talk is, you know, we looked at sort of ocean acidification at a global scale, um, but it's more complicated than that. There's, there's regional variability in carbonate chemistry, and this sort of is called coastal acidification. So we need to start bringing in the ideas of coastal acidification into assessments like this. Again, it's not just ocean acidification, it's not just temperature, climate change represents a whole host of uh, environmental factors that are changing quickly and going to levels which are unprecedented in the geological record. So it's this idea that we need to look at multiple stressors, not just one or the other. Um, from a, you know, just a practical point of view, we need to work in terms of doing experiments in conditions that are expected under the next 20 and 30 years. You know, those are the time scales which are relevant to management. Um, you know, it is very uh, good to know that ocean acidification will have major impacts at the end of the century, um, but management happens this year, next year, the next 10 years. So we need to start thinking about what the impacts of ocean acidification are on these populations at these shorter 10, 20, 30 year timescales. And then we also need to work on both fisheries and aquaculture species. And these graphs show the value of catch of species in the mid-Atlantic, so that's North Carolina to Connecticut, um, and in New England, which is Rhode Island to Maine. So this is the mollusks. These are the clams and scallops. So 68% of the value of fisheries um, in the mid-Atlantic come from mollusks. And those mollusks, if you remember, are the ones which are going to be highly, very highly vulnerable to ocean acidification. If you look in New England, 34% um, are very highly vulnerable to climate change. So it's, it's critical that we do continue to work and find out more about the effects of ocean acidification on these mollusk species, clams and scallops, and that we also look more at depth and crustaceans. So this 48% of the value in New England is largely lobster. Um, there's been some work, but not much work done on the effects of ocean acidification on lobster. Um, so there's a lot of work to be done, but we hope that the, our assessment can provide fisheries managers in the Northeast the ability to see where the risks and challenges are that they're going to face in the next, uh, by the middle of the century. This methodology is being applied nationally now. There's assessments underway in the Bering Sea and in the California Current, and in the next couple of years it'll be applied um, throughout the nation. So with that, I'll um, stop and pass it over to Hauka.